chose to use the Flint River for a short period of time. Look, Jerry, what makes that? It's working, Jerry. Look at that ball. What makes that? Look at how it works, Jerry. That's what it makes. Sir. You're killing me. Sir. Please. I'm not killing anybody. We have an agenda in your... Under Michigan Public Act 436, a law championed by Governor Rick Snyder, the state can take over financially struggling cities by handing complete authority to an appointed emergency manager. Emergency managers can break collective bargaining agreements, create new ordinances, abolish existing laws, sell off assets, and take away health care benefits from retirees. There's only one thing the law prohibits them from doing. It's interesting to note in Public Act 436, the emergency manager cannot void a contract with bondholders. That's off limits. Bondholders are sacred. They cannot be touched. People are not sacred. Nearly every city and school district that has had its democracy suspended under emergency manager is a community like this. Majority African American and settled with high poverty rates. What these communities also have in trouble is that severe cuts in state funding have helped push them into financial distress. Okay, that was um, just the beginning of Here's to Flint, the documentary about the um, ongoing. More than a water crisis now, uh, and I have with me Kate. Kate, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Are we, are we on the air? Yep. Uh, Kate Levy. Um, the Levy. Levy. Okay, so, but you know, <laughs> of of the you're the filmmaker of Here's to Flint. Um, and I just played a couple of minutes of it. It's so it's free on the ACLU uh, Michigan uh, website for people to watch. And I want to thank you for joining me on Organic News on Awake Radio. Thank you for having me. Um, and so, okay, like I'm just going to go back. It all started in the summer of 2013. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, started probably far before that. Um, when you think about sort of the uh, the policies that have been, um, you know, in place and sort of building to having more power, um, you know, since uh, Public Act Four was passed in 2011 in Michigan, and even before that, uh, the Act uh, Public Act 72, which um, Public Act Four replaced, um, all of which put cities into some sort of financial receivership where local elected control no longer has um, full say in the finances of the of the city or school district um, that that is put into receivership. And uh, Public Act 436 is by far the most severe uh, rendition of, of this law, um, mostly because it can't be repealed. Um, so when we say that the crisis in Flint started in 2013, I think it's really important to not tie the origins of the crisis so much to the, um, to, you know, the, the um, act of, you know, voting to go to the Karagandhi or, you know, deciding to switch off of the Detroit system as much as, you know, austerity politics and, um, you know, emergency management uh, in Michigan. So, um, right, this Public Act 436 was put into effect by Governor Rick Snyder to elect these emergency managers who have the complete authority to um, bargain bargaining agreements, um, new ordinances, abolish ex existing laws, sell off assets, and also to take away health benefits from retirees. But the only thing that they're not that they're prohibited from doing is breaking these contracts with the bondholders. Yeah, that's that's correct, um, and that is uh, certainly something that Kirk Ayat, the um, journalist who uh, worked on this project with, who um, you know began following the Flint water crisis even before I did, although I was very closely following the water shutoffs in Detroit um, at the time that it started. Um, 
you know, is, is, you know, spent his, you know, the last few years researching this law, sort of understanding the implications um, and the limitations and, you know, additionally, how, which, which cities it's been implemented in, um, you know, or which cities the state has chosen to implement the law in, um, you know, and predominantly African American cities, um, you know, and ones that have received state, uh, revenue sharing cuts, uh, over the last, um, 10 years. Uh, but, but also, um, you know, there's a trend of privatizing access, um, as well as, as entering into more debt. Um, something, you know, that we've seen is, you know, just, just anecdotally by observation across the board in all of these cities is that, um, you know, they, um, take out more debt, whether it has to do with, uh, bankruptcy exit financing, as was the case in Detroit, or, um, simply, um, borrowing more now, um, to balance the budget and, you know, kick the can down the road. So, um, um, Detroit and now Flint, they, they kind of, they, I mean, they had problems sort of way before the water, like the water crisis is now just compounding a previous, right, financial cuts, uh, a financial emergency. This, um, Public Act 436 was actually put into place as a financial emergency to make um, people more financially accountable. And it, right. it, it really did. Which is a, really a misnomer um, because the, the people who are being responsible are the people in the state who cut the funding to begin with, you know, um, divert funding patch a budget shortfall someplace else. That's something we've seen Rick Snyder do consistently, especially in education, is divert funding from education um, in order to uh, make his, you know, general fund budget look better. Um, and so we do have a long history, not just in cities across Michigan, but um, in cities all across the U.S. of uh, defunding public, you know, service, um, you know, water systems, infrastructure, um, and um, then calling it a fine turning around and calling it a financial emergency, um, which is very convenient. Um <laughs> when you meet people who follow politics close enough, you uh, you don't, they don't realize that it has nothing to do with the locally elected officials, that the locally elected officials are doing everything they can and, and under very trying circumstances. So the standards that we hold when we say accountability, um, you know, we have to really differentiate between uh, the, the accountability of those who have power versus the accountability of those who do not. Um, and I think that we really hold our, our locally elected officials to very unfair standards given the lack of funding um, on a federal and state level. And we see this in Detroit public schools as crumbling buildings, you know. Still, we do not have federal or state funding for school buildings. So accountability is a very misleading word. Um, right. So you, you you had mentioned that. So and like this is happening in a um, a, a high. There's high poverty rates. It's the majority are African Americans. Um, so the the emergency management then. Instead of managing emergencies, they're actually creating emergencies. Uh, I, I I do believe that um, there there is definitely a sort of a shifting of of, of emerge. You know, you, you maybe you fix something here, but uh, you know, you have a flood somewhere else. And then, you know, so it's, it's yes, that's I, I essentially what I believe to be happening. Um, and it's, it's profitable to do that because then. You know, you defund the Flint water system, and you know, or you have a water crisis, and um, if it's framed properly through the media, which is where my job comes in to make sure that narratives are told fairly and accurately uh, in a way that myriad types of people with different interests can understand. Um, you know, if, if you um, if you sort of, <laughs> I guess, understand that it's it's not. Um, in fact, uh, fixing the problem and, um, in fact, is making very select few people, uh, rich, then, you know, it's, um, I don't really know what to say beyond that. <laughs> it is, it's erasing. I, um, 
I know I have like so many sort of questions like going around in my head and I'm going to nail one question down that I have was from when uh, attorney uh, Thomas Stevens was on Democracy Now! and he was uh, pretty much insinuating to the to the possibility that uh, the governor was actually involved in the privatization of the water you know for for financial uh, gain possibly well there's a lot of different um scenarios that have like sort of played out halfway in the seems to be, um, you know, a couple of years ago, Veolia, which is a huge water, uh, international water conglomerate, was given a, a um, contract to oversee a transition process um, to a regional authority. Um, and a few years before that, the emergency manager of the city of Detroit, um, one of the first things he did was, was to put out bids to privatize the water department, which, um, you know, of course, there was profound backlash against that, but at the same time, the um, you know, the counties did not, for <laughs> some sort of ironic reason, um, did not want to enter into uh, a regional authority with uh, Detroit, although they had been trying to sort of run the Detroit Water Authority or Water Department uh, as, as a regional authority for several years prior. Um, one of the things that uh, we're really dealing with is not just private companies coming in to take over, you have, um, you know, an unequal distribution of wealth and race, um, and um, which we do in Michigan. We one of the most segregated, um, Southeast Michigan is one of the most segregated areas in the country. Um, you have a complete lack of understanding of this thing I was talking about earlier, that it's not that that local communities can't run their their cities properly if they don't have the funding to do that. So if the counties believe that the cities who have been controlling the public infrastructure, um, you know, still left over from the you know post World War II era, um, it you know or really ever it doesn't it it really doesn't um, it, it doesn't it doesn't look good to the city or to the to the counties, the, the wealthy, white, rich counties um, surrounding Detroit, um, you know, that Detroit has water stops or Flint can't, you know, it has poison water. Um, so they say, well, we need to, you know, step in and help. And one of the ways that they do that is they, con they do a lot of contracting out, right? They contract out a lot of services. So right now we have Veolia managing, again, the request for proposals to run the operations for the now complete regional authority. Um, so so even if we don't have, the point is, even if we don't have direct, you know, privatization of full public utilities, we, we have the privatization of parts of utilities, which can be just as damaging. So I then you have 50 contractors, you know, fighting for the bottom line. Yeah, yeah. The bottom line—that's always what it ends up being about. But um, is it true that because the Detroit water system supposedly was too expensive, even though Flint was on it for a half a century, fifty years, um, so like they knew that Flint was going to move to this new water system? And then raise that the price like another to ten million. Is that is that right? I heard that on a NPR radio show. For, if, oops, I lost her. Hello, Kate. Hi. I guess I lost you. Um, but, but, you know, I don't. I don't know um, the how much uh, the, you know, the rate increase for Flint was um, after it, um, you know, its contract was, you know, terminated because it needed to renegotiate. Um, I don't know what that new contract terms were. Um, I do know that Flint was a substantial, um, you know, it was the biggest wholesale customer of, of Detroit. Um, you know, beyond that, there's a lot of, a lot of unanswered questions about what, what, how 
uh, what course of events and what order these things took place in. Um, what we know for sure is that the emergency manager um, in, in 2014 rejected Detroit's final offer to keep selling them water. Um, you know, we know roughly um, how much Flint was worth to the Detroit system. We know, um, you know, several things about the Great Lakes Water Authority, which is the new sort of regional Detroit system that Flint um, left to join the Paragon New Water Authority. We know that the joining the new uh, Great Water Authority, um, we know that they did chose not to use the Flint River in the interim and decided to stay with Detroit. Um, you know, the, there are a lot of sort of fragments of information come together on this. Um, and, and you know, at, at this point, what's really needed is, is uh, <laughs> more people who have more time to do research on, you know, and, and, and connect the dots with the information that we have. Um, and that's sort of what Kurt and I have been doing for the last, you know, year is just sort of a, a constant deep dive on this stuff and yep. trying to sort of hit a moving target and, and you know, produce something as accurate as possible and as timely as, of a manner as possible. But the, um, uh, the officials in Flint, I mean, they knew that the Flint water was corroded. I mean, supposedly it was like a, a, like a well-known... Um, so, um, the, the officials didn't know that the Flint Road Water River was corroded. I mean, according to Melissa Mays, uh, you know, it was pretty much like a well-known fact that the um, the Flint River was was co corroded, polluted. Well, you know, there's two issues here. One is pollution, and I'm not I'm not um, informed enough to speak about that. Um, but but the other is. Um, the, the corrosivity of the river, and it, it seems pretty hard to believe that officials couldn't have conceived of the fact that since Detroit was adding corrosive control, and because um, you know Flint plant would not be once they switched to the Flint River, and they probably also knew that the river was many more times corrosive than the Flint or than the Detroit water system was to begin with, that they should be adding corrosive control. Um, and they forgo, they forewent that sense. Ex excuse me. Uh, this is what happens when you um, stay up all night editing. Um, what, uh, what, uh, they, they forewent the um, $100 a day corrosion control. And that's, um, that's, that scientists wouldn't think to themselves, you know, public officials, uh, you know, people from the from the city water plant, people from the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, um, you know, water scientists, Dr. Joan Rose at um, at Michigan State University, um, you know, chair of, of uh, you know, you know <laughs> water chair. I don't remember the whole extent of her title, but, you know, all these people see this brown water and not one of them thinks to themselves, huh, you know, that looks like rust. Maybe the, <laughs> maybe the iron pipes are corroding, and we should be careful about that because we also know that lead pipes um, exist within our city. Um, and so this idea that, you know, in one, in one way, the corrupt infrastructure thing is a problem because we're defunding infrastructure. But then, you know, our costs have a lot more to do with paying debt service than, the, you know, in, in city infrastructure than it does to keeping up the infrastructure. I mean, we do need to fix water main breaks. Of course, we're having an un, unprecedented infrastructure crisis in the United States. But to say we need to replace all the lead service lines in the city, well, that is a very important start given the damage that has been done. I I do not believe, based on what I know, that the replacement, and, and this is based on working on a documentary film about it for a year, um, although I am not a scientist, but I do believe that to, um, you know, they probably wouldn't have to have replaced all the lead service lines in the city had they not switched to the Flint River and chose not to use corrosion control. Right. Right, so in their attempt to, to save costs, they actually created, like, much more of a costly um, crisis. Yeah, indisputably. Uh, and so, okay, a couple of things. Um, so six months in, in using the Flint River, it was actually the GM plant 
that was able to switch back to the Detroit water because it was the Flint River water was corroding the end. Um, uh, we only have about like five I'm more minutes. Dead zone. Okay. <laughs> so um, yeah, just it was the GM plant that got to switch back to the Detroit water supply six months into using the Flint River. And so GM got to go back, but the people get to just still get the... Right, right. And one of the things that the uh, that the state officials like to say is, well, GM had nothing to do with lead. And that's absolutely true. But what they what's misleading about that is they switched back for the same reason that people are now being lead poisoned, which has to do with the corrosivity. It was rusting the GM parts. And it is also corroding lead from lead pipes. That is the same effect. Didn't they add like chlorine or something to this water? Well, that that ha- was actually a different issue. Um, total trihalomethanes um, are byproducts of chlorine, and they were over chlorinating the, the river at a certain point. Uh, yeah, so, and, and then at some, and then at another point they. <laughs> They were, for some reason, over-chlorinating it, but then they stopped chlorinating it. Um, they were chlorinating it as a plant, but they, it wasn't... I mean, it's, it's just, these people didn't know what they were doing. Right. Oh, and the, the worst part about it, really, is the fact that they were denying it. And and, and the, the people had to do and test their own water and, and do their own water samples. And the people did about 249 samples or something. And this 277. 277. And the state only did, like, a fraction of that amount. Like 50 yeah. or something. Correct. I, I, I didn't hear that number uh, that you said of the state did, but that's... 50, yeah. I said. <laughs> Is that... Yeah. Um, I, 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 uh, you know, it, they, they did more than that, um, but not by much. <laughs> uh, they, 277 samples was five times as many samples uh, uh, collected in the previous six months. Uh, so the test took place in August, the citizen test, over one month. And the state tested, you know, a certain amount, you know, 60 or 70 in the previous six months. And, um, you know, I think they're required to do like 70 something per six month period. Um, which of course, you know, they knew they were over the action level for lead in their test, you know, a year before. Uh, so the fact that there's nothing wrong is just, you know, they've treated this like a public relations crisis and not a public health crisis um, for as long as the crisis has been going on. And that includes, you know, pre-switch emergency management because emergency management does cause public health crises when you, um, when your main job is to disinvest in life-sustaining infrastructure like water and schools. So we have two more minutes. Um, I just wanted to point out that it was this previous uh, emergency manager, Jerry Ambrose, that told Lee Ann Walters, and he called her a stupid and a liar when she tried to show him her water samples being all brown and smelly. Yeah, and I'll tell you what's worse is, you know, I mean, nothing compares to that but when you're when you're forced to drink lead water. But I guess in some way it's almost more psychologically scarring when your child is in a public school system that's being run by an emergency manager and you have no say over whether your child's school get, gets closed. It's as though the school district is taking away your um, right to be as, you know, effective and as nurturing of a parent as possible because you are living in this cruel regime of emergency management. I mean, I've, I've seen it. It's, it's horrific the way that these people are treated, you know, because because this person has a job to do and the people are treated like they don't know how to elect, elect the right officials. It's, it's, it's disturbing and it makes me... I, I never thought that people had 
you know, no people are inherently evil. I never thought that anybody really was inherently evil until I until I've witnessed emergency management yeah. and the governor's um, oversight of such. Because you know, the the important thing is it doesn't stop with with the emergency manager. You know, these are mostly African American men, with some exception, um, or white men. I don't think we've had a we've had maybe one female emergency manager in the history of receivership in the state, but you know they are pawns for a larger power structure. So that Governor Rick Snyder benefits handsomely from. Yeah. Um. So I'm I'm gonna thank you and um just uh, I wanted to go out with um. Uh, it was a, a Howard Croft also who was saying that. He was going to, you know, the, the police were all ready to arrest people if they disrupted this meeting on January 21st of 2015. So they just, mm -hmm. you know, continuously, um, you know, criminalized the people that they poisoned. Yeah. So, um, Kate. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, really, it, it just is mind boggling. But Kate Levy, sorry, Levy. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Film, <laughs> filmmaker for uh, Here's to Flint. It's uh, it's on the ACLU of Michigan website. Um, so please, everyone, take a look at it. And thank, yeah, yeah. Thank you for keeping us all informed as to what's going on over there. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Hope you have a good uh, good night. You too. All right. Bye. Good night. <laughs> Emergency managers completely usurp the authority of locally elected officials. How is this democracy? Well, as much as we're in, we have for now. Basically, the mayor has no power of authority. Uh, the city council has no power or authority. We were elected by the people. There's something wrong with it. And all of us need checks and balances because none of us make the best decision all the time. We knew that this law was undemocratic. We knew it was dictatorial. We knew it was unprecedented. But we never dreamed that we would be faced with not being able to use our municipal water. While Flint was under state control, the city's long-term water source was switched from Detroit's regional system to the newly created Karagandi Water Authority. While the pipeline was under construction, the state forced the people of Flint to use the highly corrosive Flint River as the source of their drinking water. It was a cost-cutting move designed to save no more than $5 million. When we heard on the news that we might be drinking Flint water, we might be going to that, we all thought it was a joke. Because everybody knows how gross the Flint River is. There's the Flint. It's Flint. Yeah. 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 Average resident won't notice any of this. But there was a drastic difference. Almost immediately, people began to complain yeah. about water. Yeah. It looks bad, smells bad, and tastes bad. And it's just been one debacle after another. We've had three or four boil water advisories. Uh, my family broke out in a rash that we were told looks like scabies, but it wasn't scabies. The rashes, the hair loss, the muscle stiffness, the soreness. Chris, right now we don't baptize. If we baptize, we have to go outside of the city of Flint. It's all. Okay, um, just that was a little bit of. Here's to Flint, the documentary on the more than just a water crisis in Flint on the Michigan ACLU website.